Okay, um, now to be fair, let's have a look at the game book we've just seen, but reverse the role, put Houdini 2.0 in charge of the white pieces and Houdini 3 in charge of the black pieces. So the game we've just seen previously on this channel was a Sicilian defense, and this is all from book, a Keres line, very sharp Keres line. So this is all the same book moves as before, but with 2.0, Houdini 2.0 playing white. So black is playing this h5 idea. Bishop g5, knight f6, all books so far. You'll, you'll recognize the same sequence, identical to the previous video on this channel. Now, after castling queen's side, okay, here the engines start thinking. We see queen c7, and the choice of Houdini 2.0 is not to play a3, but to get on with things with f4. Okay, black plays b5, and again, no, no, no need to play a3 apparently here. So bishop g2, just securing e4 like that. Bishop b7, king goes to b1, and now we see b4 from black. <clears throat> so is this giving counterplay for black? Well, knight a4, and we see b6 being highlighted. It's at some cost to allow white to be poking into that b6 square, surely. Knight d7, and now f5, squeezing on the king side. Black's not choosing the plan knight h7 here. Houdini free has, has some other ideas, maybe the e5 square. Okay, but now a very sharp move in the center is played in this position. e5. Sorry, pardon me. E, e5, well, it is kind of sharp. It's weakening d5. Is there sufficient justification to weaken d5? Well, the knight has been driven to a4. How can the white knight get to use d5? But does it have to be a knight? Could it be another piece? White tr uh, plays now c3, so he's going to try and uh, it is going to try and use that c file. Wrench open that c file. Houdini free plays knight a5, and we get a curious case now on the board of treble pawns emerging after c takes b4. Knight takes, A takes. So these treble pawns, are they so bad? White does have the dynamic now available of the C file. And the knight potentially can either reroute or maybe still make use of B6 somehow. Bishop C6, Rook C1, pinning the bishop. F6, which weakens the diagonal, of course. Bishop E3, Queen B7. Putting more pressure on E4. That's protected with... Rook c4, bishop b5, rook drops back, rook c8. And now white doesn't mind the exchange of queens, queen b5. Houdini 2.0's evaluation here was actually close to two pawns, 1.91. And to be honest, Houdini 3.0 also agrees. <laughs> actually, even worse, it reckons it's nearly three pawns down here. <laughs> so it's actually even more pessimistic than Houdini is optimistic in the position. <laughs> so, um, so what can we say so far without giving away the game result? Well, Paul Kares was the crown prince of chess, and he had some pretty decent aggressive opening lines. And maybe, you know, it's the Kares attack which put this old Shevenigan type style of play out of business. This G4. <laughs> Pardon me, I'm snorting, sorry. Um, so, um, Queen E6, check, over excitement. King D8. Okay, now b both rooks, they double on that C file. Rook takes H4. Okay, queen f7, and is that a significant pin? Is it a virtual kind of pin? There's a pin here and here. Is that actually knight b6 on the cards? Well, after rook h8, we see knight b6, and it's starting to look pretty gruesome for black, actually. And this is plus four now, evaluated by Houdini 2.0. So we can say, and, and this is true of, of high-level correspondence chess, even engine-assisted correspondence chess, that... Um, openings the opening book is really crucial to get the opening right not to leave yourself with a disadvantage you can imagine even if you've got really the the best software and hardware 
if you've got this sort of position as black, you know, what resources are available? If you're getting stuffed like this with, with a bishop hemmed in, you've lost d5, there's infiltrations, the opponent's rooks are doubled. This is not the sort of position you want out of the opening. It's like playing handicap with, with a huge handicap in the game. It's like, it's like basically like giving material odds and expecting to be able to do something with it. So rook c7 was played. We'll check out knight takes b6 in the second pass of the game. Knight d5. After bishop takes d5, black is just giving up the queen here for not much. Or is he? Is it? That wasn't accepted in this position. After queen takes c7, pardon me, the bishop is looking at d5 here. So if rook takes c7, then there's bishop takes f7. So white does well just to take on d5 here and is looking a8 now and this, these bishops look good okay the queen goes to b8 also looking at a5 as well which it uses queen a5 check takes that pawn after rook h2 bishop f1 and it looks as though this pawn could be a runner if nothing else and for some reason black didn't even want to take that pawn here. Black plays rook h1. After b5, queen e8, it was one head by adjudication. Uh, Black thought it was like nearly seven pawns down, basically, minus 6.56. And same with white. Uh, so let's just go here to see well, wh why couldn't uh, Black take on b4? Is that a silly uh, question? I guess it is. Rook c7, giving up e4 as well. Now, what are the threats? I think the threat is bishop b5 actually to make use of that pin. So, if queen takes f5, bishop b5, and that looks pretty terminal. So, let's go back. I think really we haven't proved anything with with both videos, <clears throat> except for there's evidence that the openings uh, play a crucial role in who wins, even if you've got an amazing uh, bit of software. If you've got a rex position at the opening with the king stranded in the center and white breaking through on, on d5, this can often spell very, very bad news, basically. Um, so even Houdini 3.0 was wrecked from this position with the black pieces. Uh, there seems to be some sort of interesting treble pawn complex here. But this is giving white that c file. And now blacks weaken even more squares with that. Okay. This queen d5 invasion to e6. So again, we see a feature of both games. This bishop is hopeless. With d5 sealed and it's behind its own pawn, it's a really hopeless bishop in both games. So who said we can't blame the openings when we lose? You know, there's an often <laughs> same thing about chess players have this tendency to blame the opening when they lose. Well, actually, a lot of time it's true. If you get a really bad position from the opening, then yes, it doesn't matter how brilliant you are after. So knight b6. If if knight takes b6. The strong, strongest move is apparently is rook c6 here, not queen b7, although queen b7 is strong. That leaves the queen and priest, so say queen takes check, pardon me, check. And that's the house is coming down here on black. It's, it's just all over. So uh, that's, that's not particularly hot after knight b6. Um, so knight d5, and we saw this continuation, so black's losing that light square bishop, so he's left with the terrible bishop. And there's no more issue at e4 for the foreseeable future. Munching that pawn, and now if the queen dares to leave c7, then there's an invasion on c7. Doesn't matter about b4 and e4 here. This invasion on c7 is, is very powerful. So this puts the bishop on a nice square ready for bishop b5s. Doesn't really do much. 
b5 is a very strong pass pawn now and here okay enough was enough the operator stopped here okay that's just to be fair and to be honest I, I didn't I should have perhaps checked this second game out before showing you the first game um, so maybe we should definitely keep these two game matches together if we're going to look at more games from this match keep the two game matches together to see how both engines react from the same opening book positions it's basically a controlled experiment uh, you've got to control the opening start positions because openings play a crucial role in setting out you know, the resources available, the imbalances, the, the, the trump cards and everything. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.